Um, let me introduce you that, uh, Dr. David Chamoy, Chamoy? <laughs> from Cornell University with the entry Analytica, Analytics and Bikes, riding tandem with Motivate to improve mobility. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor to have this opportunity to present our work here today. And uh, I want to thank the committee for all their hard work through the many phases of the competition. I'm really looking forward to the rest of today and hearing the other five finalists and the outstanding work that they've done. This talk represents highlights of a five-year collaboration that a group of us at Cornell uh, had with Motivate, which is the largest, uh, runs the largest uh, North American systems in bike sharing. Uh, it's joint work with uh, Daniel Freund, who'll be taking the reins after I complete the introduction. Um, my Cornell colleague, Shane Henderson, and my former PhD, student Owen Omini, who's now driving data science at Uber. Uh, there also is a host of other collaborators who um, have been, uh, are, have been at Cornell for at least a time, and uh, many individuals from Motivate. And I want to particularly single out Jay Walder, um, the CEO and president of Motivate during our time of working with them, um, since it was really his inspiration that uh, um, help drive, motivate to be a data-driven enterprise. So to make sure we're all on the same page um, in terms of bike sharing, um, that bike sharing systems ha have emerged throughout uh, North America um, in the dock-based system variety. Um, and you can open on your app and see a plan of stations. Here you see where there are bikes available um, and if each of those thought bubbles being a station. Or you can see where there are docks available um, in this case, that red one indicates that uh, the station is almost out of bikes. And uh, if you decide to use a bike, you can go to a station and use a key like this and insert it in and release a bike. Um, or you do it, release it on your app. And the, the key element of uh, a bike sharing system is that you can rent a bike at any station and return it to any other, provided their availability. Uh, to give you a sense of scale, I'll, Motivate uh, runs systems in most of the major North American uh, cities, New York City for City Bike, Chicago, Boston, the Bay Area, Washington. Um, across all of these systems, there have been more than 100 million rides since 2010. Um, most of our work started at City Bike in New York City, where a lot of the ideas were piloted and then exported, and we're going to focus on that within this talk. And to give you a sense of City Bike scale, which is the largest of these systems, there are something like between 700, 800 stock, uh, stations, there are 25,000 docks, there are 12,000 bikes, there are 150,000 subscribers. There were 17 million rides in um, 2017 alone. And just to give you a sense on a record day that occurred just this summer, um, there were more than 80,000 trips taken in just the one day. The key challenge in operating a bike sharing system is that of imbalance that as you think about what happens in the course of a day, you have bikes that start out in residential areas and, and then users drain those bikes out of the system and then head to commercial areas typically where then the docks become full and now you all of a sudden have dock outages and it's this tension between bike, bike availability and dock availability and the asymmetric nature of, of the flow between different regions of the city that cause this imbalance. Um, motivate... Uh, has a number of operational um, levers in order to try to mitigate the effects of, of this. And uh, we've worked in providing an analytical foundation for, for essentially all of these uh, um, efforts. I'm going to turn the reins over to, to Daniel. But before I do, let's hear from our collaborators at Motivate, who will speak firsthand about their view of what we've done. I'm Jay Walder. I'm the president and CEO of Motivate. We began really from the moment that we started in late 2014 to really set out a vision of how we could provide first class, real bike share services in the largest cities in, in America. Uh, New York most prominently, but other cities around the country uh, as well. And as part of that, there had been a fledging effort, some early work that was done around relationships with Cornell and the way in which academic research could fit in with this. I came in 2014, I think that, that started before me, but I'd like to say I think we picked it up a whole notch after I arrived. In a, in a prior life, I, I ran the MTA in New York, which is the largest public transit organization in, in the United States. 
And I often tell people that the analytical process of doing bike share is actually more complicated than the analytics of running the MTA. Certainly the MTA has challenges in terms of the scale and the network effects and the like, but every train that leaves 207th Street in Manhattan arrives at Far Rockaway, and that's the way the deal works as long as it stays on the tracks. And, and it has a 110-year history of being able to, to understand the patterns of how that's being used. The, the point about bike share was we were entering a whole new space. We were literally putting it down in real time, and people were coming to it and adjusting their transportation patterns in ways that we had no basis of being able to understand. The, the work with Cornell was, was, in my mind, was, was really about giving us an analytical foundation to be able to make some of the decisions that were most critical to what we were doing. Um, knowing when to be able to move bikes, where to move bikes, where to take bikes from. And, and uh, so much of that was happening with uh, intuition. And really, we should have been, from the beginning, a data-driven organization. And the work with Cornell, frankly, was the foundation of this pivot for this company from, uh, from an operating company working on intuition to an operating company that was working with data. I'm Emily Gates, and I'm the Director of Operational Strategy at Motivate. We are constantly faced with having to figure out how to get more people to be riding our bicycles, and we have a finite number of bikes in the system. We have this problem in both directions, both in terms of um, not enough bicycles in the places where people want them, as well as uh, not enough places to put the bicycles once they get to where they're going. So rebalancing is compl complicated for various reasons. Uh, firstly, as was mentioned, the customers are moving the inventory, the bikes within the system, and are thereby also occupying the docks within the system. They are causing two-sided stockouts with regard to docks and with regard to bikes. The stockouts are actually censored. We don't know when a station is, we know when a station is out of bikes. We don't know when a customer walks up and tries to get a bike or we don't know when a customer returns a bike at one station but actually would have preferred to return it at another station, but that station was full. And on top of that, there are underlying online routing problems if we really want to figure out how to route box trucks or vans in the system to move bikes around. A City Lab article in 2014 described the problem as follows. Rebalancing is a moving target with several layers of complexity. You not only need to predict how many bikes a station will need at a certain time, but you need to minimize the costly and time-consuming movement of these vans and trucks, and you need to do it all while the system is in use. So given that rebalancing, especially the motorized kind, is so complicated, a lot of what our work has focused on was coming up with ways to reduce the very need for it in the first place. I'll be talking mostly about two different ways. One that I won't be talking about as much is called valets. Basically, the idea of having an employee stand at the station over the course of the day and just take in uh, bikes beyond the capacity of the station and just look after the bikes so they don't get stolen throughout the day. Of course, you can't do that at every station because then you would need 739 employees to do that, but you can do it at some. So one question we worked on, and I won't be going into details, was a max coverage formulation that figured out where should we be placing these valets? At what stations are they most helpful in improving the customer experience? The second part is something called Bike Angels, a crowdsourcing program that City Bike launched at first in October 2015 as, and has scaled up uh, over the time since. Uh, basically, the idea is to have customers do rebalancing for us. So we're telling customers at various times, at various places, where it would be good to move bikes to. And we are hoping, and as you will see quite successfully, that the customers will actually follow these uh, plans and help balance the system themselves. And the last piece is capacity reallocation. So those docks at each station are heavy equipment, but they can be moved in principle. And at some stations, we observe that we really have a lot more docks than we would really need. And at other stations, we have a lot fewer. 
So developing the analytics to actually decide where to move bikes from and to is the third piece in order to reduce the need for motor rest rebalancing. And it's actually the one I'll be uh, starting with. So here are two plots that give the real intuition of why we believe that, why we originally believe that this might be a good idea. You see two different stations, and the x-axis is indexed by the number of days in the first nine months of 2017. The green line on each plot denotes the capacity, the number of docks at the station. The default, unsurprisingly, is that the capacity is constant because docks on a daily basis aren't moved. However, if you look at the blue and the red points, the blue points indicate the minimum number of bikes at the station over the course of the day. So you see at this station, not on all days, but on most days, the station was empty at least once during the day. At this station, even more so. The red ones are the maximum number of bikes over the course of the day. You see at this station, on most days, the station was full or nearly full with only one dock left. That one dock was probably broken, but that's a different story. So this station is empty and full on almost all days, at least once. This station here never goes above 30. In fact, it barely ever goes above 20, even though it has a capacity of 39. So it seems like moving, bikes, uh, moving docks away from the station on the right wouldn't hurt any customers. Nobody would be inconvenienced by it. And it seems like maybe if we added docks here, more customers would be using the station. Now, that would be the intuitive way, but we wanted an analytical decision-making process that actually identifies such pairs of stations. So what is the role of analytics in this? Firstly, predicting the impact of removing or adding a dock at a particular station. Secondly, deciding where to reallocate, given the predicted impact, where to reallocate from and where to reallocate to. And finally, how to evaluate the impact on service quality after the docks have actually been moved. So we're going to cover all three of those now. The first one is based on the following objective that I'll really just describe in the deterministic setting and then it, exp uh, it extends in a natural way to a stochastic setting. So we have a finite time horizon, think about one day from 6 a.m. to midnight. And over the course of this horizon, we observe customers that show up to rent or to return bikes. So each of the bars going up is somebody who wants to return, each of the bars going down is somebody who wants to rent. We have an initial condition of bikes and docks at a station. So in this situation, we have one do empty dock and one dock with a bike in it, initially at the beginning of the time horizon. And we're going to count the number of out-of-stock events that occur over the course of this horizon. So the first customer shows up, wants to return a bike, there's an empty dock here, and places the uh, bike into the dock so that we're now at two full docks and zero empty. The next customer shows up, wants to return a bike, but the station is already full. So we get our first out-of-stock event. Then we get another rental, we get another return, we get another rental, we get another rental, now the station is empty, and the next, the final rental, is another out-of-stock event. Now, we could have evaluated the number of out-of-stock events also with a different initial condition. So for example, if we had started with two empty docks and no full dock, we would have had only one out-of-stock event. If we had started with two full docks and zero empty, we would have had three, and so forth. We could also evaluate the objective with a different sequence of arrivals. So rather than having two rentals, uh, two returns, one rental, one return, three rentals, we could have had this different sequence up there. And we would get different number of out-of-stock events for every possible initial allocation. Now, in order to define the objective that we really care about, we do some desensoring on observed demand data, and then uh, compute for uh, each initial condition the expected number over the different sequences of arrivals that we predict of out-of-stock events. We can do that in 1D over here, where we're basically keeping the capacity fixed and are looking only at the number of bikes as a variable, or we can do it like we did on the last slide as a two-dimensional function of number of empty docks and number of bikes in the station. 
the patterns that we find at different stations are greatly variable. And really, from these different patterns and the changes in the color gradient here, we can identify the impact of adding a or taking a dock at each station. So that answers the first question that we wanted to answer. At this point, let me give it back to our colleagues at Motivate. Jules Flynn, I'm EVP of Operations for Motivate. When I started in June of 2015, the user dissatisfaction functions were in use for operations, but only for overnight rebalancing functions, where to pick bikes up from. Since June of 2015, those functions have actually been used in a lot of different places in a very impactful way. Firstly, they now drive all of the operations for redistribution of bikes in New York City, but they've also been deployed in the other cities we operate in because of their value. We also use them to drive the incentive program we have we call Bike Angels, where we reward customers for actually modifying their trips or adding trips. So it's a common basis for really the most important aspect of our operations, which is making sure that we put bikes where they need to be. But we had a problem where we either didn't know where to put new equipment that would accommodate demand, or we didn't know which of our stations were being underutilized, where we were just having equipment in place that was never picked up or, or used by anyone. So based on Cornell's research and the research of Daniel, we were able to specifically measure the impact that having a dock in a particular place could have on a customer's ability to either dock at that, that location or take a bike from that location for every period of time. So seven o'clock in the morning, there are different demand patterns than there are um, at noon. And Cornell came up with a way to very simply measure the impact of a dock's availability on customers, which meant that we could move docks around and before we moved them, have a pretty good understanding of the impact on individual customers every single day. We were able to see at places where we put docks that more customers had access to the system, more customers were able to dock or to take bikes away. And the places that we actually removed the docks from, we were able to see um, that no customers were impacted by removing those docks based on this measure that um, allows us to see customer impact on a dock by dock basis. We took the analysis um, that Daniel performed in New York um, and expanded it across our systems. We are now working with cities in Boston and Chicago and DC on moving these docks around. We are running this analysis on a, every six month basis to make sure that any impact that, um, that the analysis could have is being fully utilized. And the ultimate aim was to reduce the number of vehicles that we had to use to rebalance. And we found that we were able to reduce the number of trips taken by a vehicle by one per day per station that we moved. So we only moved um, a small percentage of the docks around this time. But based on this movement, we can see a path forward for moving many more docks in the future. So what is the optimization model that would then drive the decisions of where to move bikes from into? I'll only skim over it, but the basic idea is to minimize over all possible allocations the objective that sums over all stations the expected number of out-of-stock events, the expected number of dissatisfied users, subject to four different kinds of constraints. The first two are we cannot create docs out of thin air. We can only use docs that actually exist. The second one is we cannot create bikes out of thin air. The next one is we cannot move 3,000 docs. We didn't actually have that constraint in the beginning. And we would go to motivate and say, hey, we really think you should move 1,500 docs in your system of, at that time, 15,000 docs. And they said, no, we can't move 10% of the, of the system around. So having a constraint that bounds how much stakeholders are actually willing to move was crucial for this to work. And the last constraint is we cannot say 
at 500 docks to a particular station, even if we want to. So there are physical space constraints. There are all sorts of considerations that give both lower and upper bounds in terms of how many docks we can have at particular locations. So it's not clear that one could optimize this problem. The cost function is not linear. And it's an integer problem in uh, 740 times two variables, 1,500 uh, variables almost. But it turns out that at each station, it, uh, the cost function fulfills a property called multimodularity. And the way to think about it is really as a multidimensional form of diminishing returns. Basically, the cost function fulfills inequalities indicated by the thick and the thin lines. So the difference of the thick lines it's always greater equal to the difference of the thin lines. And it's not hard to show that using just a very simple inductive argument on the sequence of arrivals at each station. Now, given this structural property, we can define a simple discrete analog of a gradient descent algorithm and prove that this discrete gradient descent algorithm in k iterations finds the best allocation that is reachable by moving at most k docs. That gives us a fast algorithm. In fact, we can extend using scaling ideas from, uh, from discrete convexity to get the fast algorithm even in polynomial time, meaning logarithmic, in the number of docs in the station. Now, <clears throat> what do we actually find if we use this algorithm? Well, it depends on how many docs we allow the algorithm to move. So on these different maps, we find how many docks get moved and where do they get moved from and to, depending on the budget in terms of number of docks moved that we give the algorithm. And you see very clear patterns with the East Village having many docks added. A lot, a lot, a large parts of Brooklyn, Brooklyn have docks removed and so forth. So that answers the second question of how to decide where to reallocate from and to. Evaluating the impact. It turns out that if we look at the arrival sequence at a station after the docks were moved and evaluate the number of out of stock events with that arrival sequence, assuming that we didn't have the, uh, uh, the additional docks, then we get exactly the impact of the added capacity. So that gives us the impact at stations where we had docks added. At stations where we had docks removed, it's not quite as simple, but we can use desensoring techniques to estimate the increase in out-of-stock events at those stations. So we did that in the month after docks were moved in New York City. Uh, as Emily said, initially only a small number of docks were moved, 34. And up here, you see the impact at stations where we had docks added on an average day, something between 15 and 20 additional customers were able to use those stations. And at the stations where docks were removed, usually nobody was inc inconvenienced. And if people were inconvenienced, it was really like two or three at most. So we had a net decrease in out-of-stock events based on moving only those 34 docks of uh, about 1,000 in one month. Since then, Motivate has, as Emily said, has moved many more docs, for example, 200 in Chicago. Um, depending on how good these plots look at diff in different cities, depends on how fast the cost of moving amortizes. In New York, it amortized in only two weeks, if you compare to the cost of rebalancing. In Chicago, it took a little bit longer, but still for a system that runs over years, amortizing in five weeks is pretty great. So that answers the third question for reallocating dock capacity, which was how to evaluate the impact of service quality. Now, to the Bike Angels program. This is something we had suggested to Motivate in 2015. And really, Motivate has taken it very far in terms of gamification. For example, with this leaderboard that uh, shows the top 10 Bike Angels, the top 10 rebalancing users every month, basically in real time. So bike angels get rewards. For example, if in a lifetime of being a bike angel, a customer gets 2,500 points, they get this very cool steel angel key, which is uh, better for bragging rights than the usual key that David, for example, would have. <laughs> now, 2,500 seems like an awful lot. But some people went vastly beyond 
the expectations. This is a single user in April 2018, going up to 7,000, 8,000 points in almost 9,000 points in just that one month. That is certainly something that we had not expected. How can we measure the impact of the Bike Angels program? Well, what we can do is we can apply, again, the user dissatisfaction functions, and we can look for every time that we give an incentive, what is the discrete derivative of the user dissatisfaction function with respect to that one bike changed, either that one additional bike or that one fewer bike on the cost function. Now, originally, Bike Angels uh, was, had fixated stations. So I remember being in the room with several others, and we said, well, the East Village runs out of bikes in the morning, and Hell's Kitchen does as well. So between 6 a.m. and 11 a.m., we should incentivize people to return bikes there. And Midtown has the opposite problem, so there we will incentivize pickup. Uh, that was not very analytical. And as we found, it still worked pretty good. So most trips incentivized in that manner were still giving us the maximum possible improvement of a reduction of one in the number of stock events, or out of stock events. However, we did have several, uh, quite a decent fraction of moves that didn't improve the system or even made it significantly worse. So, we have, can define several other policies uh, in order to uh, decide when to label stations for pickups or dropouts. Uh, either in an offline manner using historic data or in an online manner where we evaluate every t minutes the discrete derivative of the user dissatisfaction function and then decide do we want to uh, incentivize pickups in the next 15 minutes or 13 minutes or however many minutes, yes or no. And to some extent that involves trade-offs between usability and efficiency. Because if we evaluate, if we make this consideration every minute, then customers just don't have any predictability as to whether they will get a point. At the same time, if we do it every four hours, then we might as well use offline data. So, we evaluated in a counterfactual analysis a whole range of different possible policies and found that if we evaluate the discrete derivative every 15 minutes and make the decision for the next 15 minutes, we actually do just as well as if we made the decision in real time at every moment in time, at least on the data set that we looked at. That led to CityBike actually adopting this policy of uh, relabeling the map every 15 minutes. And it's now a huge success in terms of reducing the cost of rebalancing. Bike angels uh, rebalance bikes at half the cost per bike moved. And that already accounts for differences in effectiveness of where the bike went from or to. Because sometimes a bike that gets rebalanced gets taken immediately and sometimes it sits around for a while. Because of its success, it's been implemented in three other systems under the Bike Angels uh, uh, brand and in Montreal under the brand Les Amis Bixi. The membership, as you see, this is 2018. This is super recent. Even half a year ago, it was only in New York City. Uh, Two months, uh, three months ago, it also launched in uh, DC and so forth. The savings are huge because the fraction of motorized rebalancing over the last two years, this is again only for New York City, has gone down from in Q1 of 2017, 60% almost, to now just 25%. And motorized rebalancing is the most expensive kind of rebalancing for city bikes. The media coverage has also been pretty awesome. There was a New Yorker article about the guy who got 8,000 points in a single month. Uh, there was a short documentary at the New York, oops, there was a short documentary at the New York City uh, Film Festival about the bike angels. And my favorite part of it was the single bike angel who basically described how at, not, at 7 p.m. he would have dinner with his family then sit down with his family, at 11 p.m. would pull up the leaderboard just to check and see that the person behind him on the leaderboard is catching up. So he'd tell his wife, sorry, I have to run out again. <laughs> so in conclusion, rebalancing is a huge expenditure for bike sharing, uh, and we can really reduce the cost 
of rebalancing by reallocating capacity, by using crowdsourcing like the Bike Angels program. And this really caused a strategic change to how Motivate approaches its service levels. Uh, hundreds of docks have been moved since uh, the original plan, since the original pilot of just 34 docks in New York City. And uh, the incentive program uh, was also adopted in five different cities. The user dissatisfaction functions allow us to actually quantify the impact on customer experience and thereby also get an analog to actually reduce spending for rebalancing. More generally, the whole shared transportation space changes the city landscapes right now. It's no coincidence that Owen has since moved on to Uber and I am currently at Lyft. It's a huge opportunity to play a part in this changing landscape. And part of this is also displayed in Motivate, recently having actually been acquired by Lyft. This had nothing to do with us. Thank you very much.